clumsy. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Princeton Public Library. My name is Jenny Herman, and I am the manager of adult programming here at Princeton Public Library. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone tonight, both here in person and on our YouTube live stream. Uh, tonight's conversation is about Boo Trundle's literary debut, The Daughtership. This event is a collaboration between the library and Labyrinth Books. As always, we are grateful to the staff and owners of Labyrinth Books for their ongoing support and collaboration, not only for this event, but for so many others that we do all year round. So a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please note this room is equipped with a hearing loop that pairs with T-Coil technology if you require hearing assistance. Also, we kindly ask you to silence your electronic devices and hold your questions as there will be a chance for Q&A at the end of the session. The book signing will take place immediately following the Q&A session and it'll just be outside in our lobby there to my right. So I'm going to quickly introduce our moderator and then pass the microphone to Virginia Harbin to say a few words about our author. Virginia works at Labyrinth Books and is a fan of books. So Christy Henry is our moderator tonight and she is the director at Princeton University Press. Uh, where she, um, and before coming there, she had nearly 30 years experience in university press publishing. Since her arrival at Princeton University Press in 2017, they have launched an audio imprint, an equity and inclusion strategic initiative, a community building committee, a digital marketing team, and an in-house speakers agency, among many other endeavors. The library works a lot with Princeton University Press and with Christy, and we're so grateful also for Christy's ongoing support of our library. Uh, Christy is a graduate of Dartmouth. She's a member of multiple university press boards and is an active member of the Princeton community where she lives with her family and she's not traveling. <laughs> um, so with all that being said, I'm now going to turn the microphone over to Virginia from Larry Cross. Thank you, Jamie. I had all these thank yous lined up. Christy and Lou and Janie in the library for another library live, but trust a librarian to do your work for you. <laughs> uh, let me tell you about Boo. She's a, an artist who works in all media. She used to be a singer-songwriter. She's a storyteller, a critic, a video maker, a painter, a collage maker, a book reviewer, including a book she has not read, uh, a creator of experimental videos, including in shame reduction, a high score on many moth performances, a comedian, a kind of therapist. To me, Boo is also a character, a voice, a point of view. As she herself has put it, the girl can talk. The girl can also write. We're celebrating the publication of this wonderful work of fiction, The Daughtership, a work of expedition, wreck diving, integration, transformation. It's a remarkable achievement. I've been dwelling in its atmosphere. This book works on a resonant subconscious level, brings to mind uh, the way a sestina works, repeated images that move and change and haunt and recur in a closed and oppressive echo chamber, the crowded and noisy psychic landscape inhabited by trapped and worried children who come out of containment, pressure, submersion, weight, depth, darkness, Barnacles, claustrophobia, mold, sweat, oil, crabs. <laughs> it's also about midlife, motherhood, divorce, self-redemption. The ending is breathtaking. This book goes on a shelf in my imagination that holds what I think of as impossible novels, like this should have been impossible. Um, on there is Jean Reese, Mary Robison, Memoirs like Lights On, Rats Out, uh, Operators and Things, the comics of Alison Bechdel, Linda Barry, the films of Cassavetes, Adrian Rich is there, Megan Mary Daly, all those have gone deep, trowled for self-understanding, the truth, the true story, and are deeply resistant to the man. <laughs> Boo makes a study of herself, but somehow it's for the good of all of us. I'm so proud to welcome the enigmatic, magnetic, ethically transformative philosopher inventor, Bo Trump. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best. 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 That
Uh, I also hope you'll publish that review somewhere. The, the, I think I need to use that in <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you. Beautiful, beautiful description. Mm -hmm. Mary Daly. Yeah. I don't hear her name very often anymore. I am so happy to be here with all of you tonight and talking about a book that is, um, as Virginia just described, it is intense, it is evocative, it endures in your mind and in your soul and in your heart, and to do so with Boo. I feel like it's important to share a disclaimer. Uh, we are up here together tonight in part because we are distantly related as sister-in-laws-in-laws. -in -laws. <laughs> but I also want to repeat what's in the front of the book and that this is a work of fiction. Um, it is autobiographical fiction and so we will talk about some of that. But um, but what a treat to be meeting here for the first time in probably several decades uh, connecting around this book. Uh, as um, I am I am swimming in waters I'm not usually in, so I may occasionally need a flotation device, and I'm counting on Boo to be that device for me. I've worked in nonfiction publishing for a very long time. I'm an avid reader, and fiction is a, a, a joyful escape. This book is not a joyful escape. Um, there are moments of levity. It is an intense, atmospheric. Um, the recreation of the submarine is very real for the reader, and it's one of the amazing feats that's pulled off this book. As a publisher, I want to start at the at the end, actually in the back matter, which I know is where not where most readers start, but in it, who reveals the methodology of the book, which I found fascinating, uh, ambitious and challenging, and you describe it as a as a cut up approach and methodology. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, how that leaves us with pieces of Jack and the Beanstalk and fixing an engine and um, and where that process began. Sure. Um, I like that you start with the end, the end matter. I have had people say that's their favorite part of the book, which is interesting. Um, and it was something that caused me a lot of anxiety when I got my book deal because um, this is not the first novel I've written, and I was writing in a very wild and free manner, um, sort of on the assumption it wouldn't get published. And so, yes, I was folding in text from other books. And then when I got the book deal, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have footnotes for everything that um, I took from another book. And it, so it is called um, Cut Ups. It started uh, with the Surrealists in the 20s in France. And basically, just uh, what I would do is, and I, and I learned it in a, in a poetry workshop. So I was taking a poetry workshop while I was working on my novel. And I would sign up for, I like generative workshops. I like taking workshops where you do writing in the workshop. Um, and the poets love that, you know, and they also love to play games. And so uh, this was just one of the games we played where you would take, um, you know, for example, Jack and the Beanstalk, and you would take actual um, words from the book, you would Xerox it, cut it up, and then fold it into your writing. Um, and then that became a theme in my book. Jack and the Beanstalk became a theme in the book. And uh, another one was engines. So, like, we would bring in, we were told to bring in science articles. And again, we would Xerox them and then kind of throw them in the middle of the room, pass them around. It was just very loose. Um, and I got interested in engine repair as, an, as just a metaphor for personal healing. There was, and that led to oil. So then oil became a theme. You know, so there are a lot of images and um, metaphors just flying around the book. They're everywhere. But, but they are also very controlled because they were on little pieces of paper. So it becomes this kind of giant puzzle. And to, and that's how I now that's how I write. Like I'm working on a new novel, and yesterday I was xeroxing. I I'm trying new stuff. I play games with the text, and for me, that just freed. Um, not only did it free my subconscious, but I think it grounds me as a writer. Like you know, I think um, having something visual and having something like cutting it with scissors and having a piece of paper that I'm flipping around and then pasting. I love glue stick, like Elmer's glue stick. That's like my dream. <laughs> Because it's just very uh, concrete, very sense oriented, and it grounds me. Um, and you know, the book is about a character who has uh, PTSD and trauma symptoms, which I also share, and that has made it hard for me to sit down and write for three hours, you know. And but this is more like finger paints, it's just very freeing. And I still got a novel, like, like you said, and possibly I still got a novel out of it somehow. Like, there was a lot of shuffling and reshuffling. And, yeah, like, if you remember Beautiful Mind, the movie where you go in and like things just glued up all over the walls. I mean, I know a lot of writers work that way. Um, it's not, I didn't make it up and it's not unique, but it really worked for me. You talk about, um, and you just referenced it, about things sort of flying around. And, and one of the, as themes, I see a number of them as characters in this book, sort of meta level characters. 
And one thing that flies around and sparks a lot is energy. Maybe it's also coming from engines or where we find sources of, of, um, of generative energy. You, there are tons of phrases, and please read this book if you haven't already, because the wordsmithing is just genius. Um, you talk about uh, vessels of electricity, sleeves for light, you charge battery cells with your energy, you feel like a blown fuse, that's one that comes up. You have characters, anode, cathode, Energy, um, one of the, I think, best terms of phrase, energy works in the body unless it kills you. Uh, tell me about energy and where that came to the theme. You also talk about people radiating energy, sparks flying out of individuals. Uh, you see the world with a, I think, an energetic overtone, and I'd love to talk about that. Um, well, there's lots of ways to answer that question. Um, could go back to the what I was talking about earlier, and I was doing this method of bringing in scientific resources or scientific language into the book by taking concepts like engine repair and then getting books, Xeroxing it, finding interesting language, so much interesting language about engines, you know, and um, so, but I found that I'm not really a science person and so I started taking books out of the children's science section at the library, <laughs> which is a really wonderful way to learn science because it's there's lots of pictures and it's all very, it, it's very simple. It's still hard to understand. Electricity is one of those things that we use all the time and uh, it's complicated and there's some stuff you just have to kind of, at least I do have to take a leap of faith, but it just works and don't ask me how or why. Um, so yeah, electricity. And then there was, so I got interested in electricity. And even to the point of looking at power plants, and it fed also into the uh, the oil. Like I, there was a lot of stuff I didn't understand about oil. I mean, it's embarrassing what I don't know, what I what I didn't know, and still don't know that well about how the world runs. And so, yes, yeah, science. The, I, the librarian was excited, but like the the children's <laughs> section of the library with the science book. So um, that was part of what started the interest in electricity, and then also. Um, I actually have my certificate in clairvoyant healing, which is uh, chakra oriented psychic healing, and that is extremely energy oriented. And there, you know, you might it, it kind of it would start probably like in physics or quantum physics, but it's it's a uh, there's a, uh, there's an energy movement I would say going on in the United States. You know, I, I am very interested in healing. It's like it's part of my path. It's been that's why I can sit up here right now. And be alive to tell my story is because I've done so much, so many different healing practices, and one of them, well, was energy work, and I started doing that while I was writing the book, and it's it's an incredible way to access sort of metaphorical story stories about yourself by going into your energy. So mm -hmm. I was doing a little energy work right before I came in, just to kind of ground myself. So they call it grounding. It's very the word is very scientific because yeah. like, but you do it in your imagination. So that was at play in the novel. I just connected some beautiful dots. Okay, thank you. Now I'm going to go back and reread it. Okay, now I'm hoping you can connect, connect the dots on this one. Um, the, another character, and Virginia mentioned it, um, crabs. There are a lot of crabs in this book. There are crabs in, playing around in ink pots. There's crab salad coming out of arteries. Um, I'm not sure I can eat crabs again in quite <laughs> the same way. I have to tell you. Yeah, I'm like, I don't eat crabs. There's so crab yeah, infestations. Where did crabs first crawl into your um, your space? We also just learned an interesting story about suction and crabs, right? Tell me more about these Virginia crabs. Uh, yes, I grew up in Virginia Beach, and so there is a lot of nautical uh, imagery. Well, the submarine, for example. Um, and I, where the crabs came from, like, I actually can't remember how. Probably from shells, because you know, once I started studying oil. Um, you know, and sand and the way that oil and shells, the way they decompose, and again, I might have to have the science exactly right, but then I just got some books about the seashore, and there's so much nautical imagery. They just sort of came, uh, you know, and, and the thing is, like, once you start working with a symbol or an image, it, it just leads to another way of using it. I mean, even point one, at one point, the character has pubic crabs, you know, she's just got, she has relations with the wrong person and she ends up with crabs and so then I'm like well that works you know that crabs you know so it's like you know the book is that way or she meets her best friend and she gets bit by a crab in the ocean she meets her friend in the ocean and she gets bit by a crab you know so it's just um 
my relationship with story is very untraditional, I think, mm -hmm. and not particularly linear. And this story tells itself often through just me grabbing an image and rolling with it. Um, a lot of it, and, and then it, it, yeah, there is a sort of satisfaction because it all kind of wrapped, like you said, at the end, it all kind of comes together. It does make sense. So, um, and they reappear, right? They, they, they do. They do. Different manifestations. Uh, so, not to stick on the, the the case of crabs, but I do want to come to <laughs> the. Um, there is there's another sort of meta level experience in, in reading this book, and that is about the corporeal. Uh, there are again some incredible turns of phrase um, from from describing characters with bad breath um, to a quote. Um, I shouldn't say this word. Um, like avalanches bearing down on a ski lodge full of people eating chili. Um, and the first one, the word that I didn't say, because I'm not sure what I should say when, on this don't camera. Write it down. Don't anyway, say it. That way you'll be able to sleep today. Yes. It's about when you, you, you do a bodily function. And it was described <laughs> as avalanches bearing down on a ski lodge of people eating chili. And I was, I was reading this book. Um, Chris, I mentioned to Taboo earlier. I, I read it with this a uh, relatively new nonfiction book called On Our Best Behavior, which is about um, the seven deadly sins and the price women pay to be good. And there are some fascinating themes in that book about shame and how women have to navigate a world with shame. There's uh, there's such a tonic in the pages of this book because it really is, there's a, there's a sort of bold, courageous woman. There's also vulnerability and humility, but the to have the body um, be so present in the work, and then the work of a woman writing in a, and again in a corporeal way. It's not a, it's not a gentle way. It's a rather intense way. I, um, I wonder how intentional that was. Is it? If you're, you're sort of provoking the reader, but you're also trying to get them to be comfortable with this vessel that we're in. Um, I think intentional is always a really interesting question when you're talking to a writer. Um, because I would love to say that everything's intentional and that I have a grand vision and a grand plan and um, it's more just like that's who I am and um, that's how it comes out. And you know, I remember actually like we share, like she was saying, we share some relatives. My brother is married to her husband's sister. <laughs> I've done this so many times now I can pretty much do it right. I had to sort of sit down with a calculator and figure it out. Um, but I remember I gave my brother a draft of a book. He's a doctor too, and I gave him a draft of a book I wrote. He's like, I don't really need to focus so much on body fluids. You know, like doesn't need to be such a big part of the book. You know, so like I think it's just my nature. I'm actually squeamish, but maybe that's why I write about it. And shame is a big topic in the book. And there's definitely things in the book that, um, like every single person who has interviewed me has sent an email saying. What do you not want to talk about? You know, there's like, you know, because there's just stuff in the book that would be very uh, hard, it's hard to talk about. And I mean, I kind of call it the unnameable or the unspeakable, um, which is such a big part of our lives everywhere. Um, and it's, it's, that's been a kind of painful part of the book coming out for me. It's just, um, there's just stuff in the book that nobody wants to talk about. I can't, I literally can't talk about it. And that is part of why I wrote the book. And so, yeah, like I said in my, my I made a promotional video for this, and I said, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but obviously I must want to make people uncomfortable. But it's happening at the same time. And and, 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 there, and shame is a big theme in the book, and that is sort of, the, sort of one of the ways shame manifests, is you, know, you don't want to feel it. And then once you feel it, you can't stop feeling it. And if you can talk about it, it might go away, but you cannot talk about it. I mean, it's just that sort of double bind that goes on around um, and yeah, it goes around around something like diarrhea or whatever. You know, whatever or shame. So but she built up a capacity in the reader through the course of this book and through the course of these corporeal invocations. It seems less shocking it's as like you beat go you over the head. Yeah, it's just you just practice it's developing a muscle. It, it, the, the reaction changes. It's fascinating. Oh that's what um, I'm here. Actually yeah. nice feedback. Uh, I, Another character is truth. So there's this sort of reluctant and courageous search for truth. And you say at one point, truth just is. And, and you're speaking about the book as, as a way of processing and, um, and, and I think grounding at the same time. Were there points in writing that you thought about writing nonfiction? 
pulling the trigger no. from that mm-hmm. product? No. Nope. Okay. Um, I just was curious. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question, but like I said, I was taking, I, I got um, interested in these generative memoir workshops, and I was in these classes with uh, memoir writers, but I was writing fiction, and I was always just very clear, well, I'm writing fiction, you know, but I was using all these exercises that help you access your memory, help you remember, like the way that Summerine came about was um, the, the assignment was to, to first to draw a map of something from your childhood that you remember. And so I drew a map of my parents' bathroom, this weird bathroom that kind of went like the master bedroom, and then my mom had a little bathroom, and then there was like a little toilet, and it was one of those bathrooms was like cut up into little pieces instead of just being one big bathroom. And I drew this maze of bathrooms, and then I ended up drawing a submarine. And they kind of spoke to each other because the submarine is the same way, and the space is broken up into little tiny pieces. Um, so I was writing about my actual childhood home, and that was a memoirish experience, but then I was making up this entire speculative fantasy world inside of Summer May, which you can't do in nonfiction. So I, I feel very committed to the fiction genre. I read a lot of fiction. I browse nonfiction <laughs> and um, I devour fiction. So I, I, it's, it's, I never thought of it being nonfiction. And then also, um, this is just circling back to the first thing you said just now about truth. I've had a really hard time with truth my whole adult life. Um, my truth and my siblings' truth, for example, about things that we grew up, things that we experienced were never a match. And I just sort of had to let go of the truth um, as a possibility or as something that I needed in order, I don't really need things to be true in order to write about them or talk about them. And you know, even have a therapist one time, she was like, it doesn't really matter if it's true or not, we can still heal from it, you know? And that was really liberating for me because I was so hung up on like, well, how can I, how can I, talk about it if I'm not sure it's true. And she was like, who cares? You know, and so that kind of who cares is at play in fiction. And I needed it. I, I don't know that I could survive if I were to be I mean even having to do with footnotes was those are facts. Those are facts. Those are the facts. Yeah. That's a boring yeah. That, 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 that's, that's why some people love the end notes. Yeah. I love <laughs> All right, so let's um, let's dive into the ship itself and and move into some See of the how, other characters. How, how easy it turns into so a pun. Or it totally does. Oh, sorry, my ship's that's the closest thing I had to like a pea coat. Yeah, it's just kind of um, it is. It was not. Um, uh, I want to talk about the women. I want to talk about the the, the three characters on the boat, um, and I really want to hear about Smoosh Plug. Uh, who came first? Were they were they one character that was cut up into three? Were they, if you could introduce those three to us. Well, this is a good time to talk about the sort of um, therapeutic process that went into writing the book because um, it's called uh, Internal Family Systems, and it was an actual therapy uh, program I was involved in while I was writing the book. Probably took about like eight years to write the book, so it wasn't the whole time, but somewhere along the way I started doing inner child work. And I don't know if anybody knows about inner child work, but you basically, um, access, you kind of treat yourself, um, how do I explain it? It's energy work, basically, like I was talking about earlier. It's it's imaginative, and you imagine, you know, you do meditation, you imagine yourself coming face to face with the child you once were. And you can have conversations with that child, you can hold the child's hand, there's lots, there's different ways that you can use this modality. But uh, this IFS system of child, inner child work assumes that everybody has many parts. That we're, you know, it's kind of like we're all on a spectrum. Um, you know, like in the '60s, like that book Sybil, where Sybil had multiple personalities. That's that's sort of the Hollywood version of of having many many selves. Like you know, one was Victor and one was like Helen, and Victor was you know, or like the I don't know if anyone ever saw United States of Terror, which is a TV show, but it's it's kind of Hollywood makes it look like multiple personalities, but the truth is that we all have many parts inside of us, like the part that wakes us up in the morning, like, yeah, if you lady Zach, you know, whatever, and like, I said, get up, why are you still lying about, you know, and then there's that other part that's like, I don't have to get up, like, I don't like living, you know, like, whatever, like, these inner dialogues happen between our parts, um, so I was exploring that, and that's where they all came from, and they literally are, work, they are the parts that I found in therapy, so it was one is named Star, the star is uh, 13, like going on 30. It's like that sort of adolescent girl who thinks she is way more mature than she is, wants to wear makeup and just looks silly in it and trying on her mother's clothes. Like she's precocious, 
Um, and that's where her, and it's also the main character, Catherine, these parts live inside of her. And Star is the sexualized part. She carries all the sexual energy. She's also disembodied, which is a problem. Because <laughs> she's carrying all the sexual energy. She doesn't have a body. Yeah. But she's an energy. Like She just kind of lives in the light bulb. She's light-oriented. So she's the one who carries a lot of that electric um, imagery with her. You know, She warms people up. She's attractive. She's charming. Um, and then Truitt is one of, and he's also a girl, but he identifies as a boy. Um, is I mean, he's a girl in the sense that he lives inside Catherine, so that's a woman's body, but he's completely a boy. He's a boy scout, basically, and a bully. So he's the bully, which I think we all have a bully. Um, so he just like goes around beating the girls up, you know, and then Smushbug, who is my favorite, and a lot of people like Smushbug, yeah. Yeah, is just, she's eight, she doesn't have a voice. She is submissive. She is also bossy in her way, and everyone takes care of her. But also, she um, she gets along to go along, or goes along to get along, and she gets abused. You know, and that's the one she's carrying all that and doesn't speak up about it, and doesn't want um, ultimately anyone else to talk about it. So she's sort of the shame, shamed part that is really caught, really trapped in this summer. Um, so. And ultimately, Catherine decides, I don't think I'm giving this away, but Catherine decides to keep them all afloat, which is, is a really beautiful outcome. But there are a lot of dead girls along the way. Yeah. So how are the, and, and layers, sediment of dead girls in the bottom of this brackish water. It's very, very evocative. How, how do you decide which girls end up on the bottom of the water and which stay afloat? Well, the dead, so dead girl is also one of the parts um, that came to me during therapy. And I mean, it's also very symbolic. Um, so again, I, I, I wasn't, um, there wasn't a lot of decision making going on. I was just letting these parts kind of speak up and dead girl. And also a lot of the dead girl got worked out in the editing. Like that was the one thing, like when I turned my book in to my editor, she felt dead girl was a little vague and like kind of like, like you know, what was going on with that girl? And so I really had to um, work that out. And you know, I don't know if there's any writers in the room, but sometimes you just turn something in, and you're like, hopefully they won't notice that that girl <laughs> not really worked out yet, you know? But she did notice. And so I worked a lot of that out in the later drafts, just kind of making it clear, um, even in the headings, um, and not to get too like uh, technical, but even the headings, I had to work that out. I think it all came out clearly, but it was, um, Dead Girl's almost a ghost or a spirit, so she didn't really want to be defined, I don't think, and I had to just kind of make that happen. Yeah, she definitely has less, right, less persona than, than the others, but, but she intervenes at opportune moments. Right, yeah, really she moves, she moves in and out. Yeah, she does. And, and, and tell us a little bit about also the, the lineage, there's something about Dead Girl that carries, carries her genes and experience forward into the, the Catherine. Um, how much of Dead Girl did you, did you start with Dead Girl being a, sort of a more purposeful lineage, connecting also some really hard, challenging slavery, racism? Can you tell us a little bit about that process? And because that's the Dead Girl, there's a Dead Girl theme that's connecting a history. Um, yeah, so Dead Girl also became attached to the phrase Dead Girl to Catherine's ancestors uh, who are who are matrilineal. It's the matriarchy going back in her mother's family to the Civil War where she had a grandfather, like a grandfather, great great grandfather who was a soldier in the Civil War, a very bad person. Um, so yeah, it's like very bad person, very bad person. And that needed to be, it, it filters down. You know, it has filtered down through the generations, like um, in various ways, and as shame. And so that you know, these 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 dead girl characters are guides, and they're also they symbolize DNA, really. Like there's there's been a lot of research done about like how we carry our gen, our ancestors' trauma in our DNA, like that we carry in our our blood chemistry. Um, and so, and again, in the corporeal sense, it was a way of finding a, like a sort of concrete flesh and blood uh, way to talk about ancestral crimes 
and the shame around it, but also the denial. I mean, a lot of denial. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just really interested in, um, just really interested in talking about psychological and philosophical, philosophical ideas in a nuts and bolts way as a story. And so, yeah, so I have to find ways to do that. And it is, um, as I'm working on this new book, it's, it's a miracle. If it works, it's going to be a miracle, but I can't, I have to accept that it might not work. I'm trying it again in a different way, but it's the same concept, which is this time I'm working with the emotions, but just how to, these things that like affect us every single day of our lives from the moment we wake up, it's not like electricity, for example, that we don't really understand. We don't really have language for So I'm trying to, or like I said, the unnameable, I'm trying to put words to things that are almost impossible to put words to. And that actually, the easiest way to do it is to is to use symbols and imagery and 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 i'm a visual person and 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 then the symbols and energy tell their own story you don't even have to you make it seem amazingly possible i have to say because <laughs> you, you, you define it as impossible but that's not the picture it's impossible. <laughs> uh i found myself also in reading this really wanting to hear what it sounded like in your own voice and i know you're going to spend some time Okay. Yeah. I know Jane, I'm watching the time. Yeah. But Just ten minutes. Don't worry. Yeah. It's, okay. it's not, not a minute more or a minute less than that. Yeah. So, um, I timed it, and also I'm going to try to do some voices as I'm working yeah. on this. I did a I did a radio show last week, and I'd never done that. It was kind of like Lake will be gone, but it was down in the South called Backer Mountain Radio. And I was on stage with a mic reading, and then there was like a band behind me and all that. And I realized, you know, if you're going to do radio, you have to do voices. So. I can't play music. I'm so. gonna try. I'm gonna try to make the voices sound a little different. I actually looked up a YouTube video of how to do it today, but it was just a few hours. I might. I told um, Virginia and Christy, I might chicken out. If so if I just revert to just one voice, then you have to forgive me. Okay. So yeah. So I basically put together. Um, does this sound good? Am I sound something to feel like a little? I'm I lowered it a little. Yeah. Oh, you lowered it. Yeah, I allow it. Um, okay. So. I don't want it to be um, supported. So yeah, so I just basically um, went through and I I just took a little piece of a lot of the different voices we've been talking about, and that way um, you get a taste of how how they are all telling the same story and they're just telling it differently <laughs> through it. I want to introduce you to my girls. We all live together in a U-boat. Why are we trapped in a German submarine? Because my dad, Craig, is a World War II buff. We grew up browsing his bookshelves in Virginia Beach. It's a naval town, home to aircraft carriers and battleships. Fighter jets rip the sky above the dunes. Somewhere underwater and not too deep is our submarine, a ghost ship, a wreck, a childhood. Ding! That's the sound of the echo sonar searching for a target. I may not be the smartest kid in the submarine, but I'm the loudest and the strongest and it's up to me to decide what's true. The others have their own idea of true. Smushbug star, they have their stories. Smushbug says, there's no such thing as true. I know what's true, I tell her. I know what happened. True to you, she says, it's not the same as true. Smushbug. Truett sits his butt down at the navigator's desk. It's in the middle of the passage, screwed to the floor, a table with folding leaves. I want to tell you a story. No, Bob, no story. Star is talking to me, but she is still in the light bulb. I can barely hear her. Your stories suck. This is a good one, I promise. Is it Jack and the Beanstalk? asks Truett. He has his sextant and his gyroscope lined up over his nautical chart, which is silly. Our steel coffin has a budge in years. No, I tell him, it's not Jack and the Beanstalk. Haven't you heard that one enough? Then it's a memory, not a story. Why don't you call it what it is? It's one of your precious memories, and you want to tell us all about it again and again. I hate to annoy Truett, but I have to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. There's nothing else to do. The submarine is hot and smelly, green mold on the sliced bread, rotten lemons with white sores on the rind. Sheets that were wet with sweat, then dried again. Wool blankets that smell like feet, and not much air. I stand in the galley kitchen. Space is tight. There's no natural light. I'm wearing dirty polyester separates from Sears. Star is 13. 
Druid is 15 and I'm only eight, but I'm the leader. Druid is afraid of me. He has to take care of me. He can't hurt me. He wouldn't dare. It's a love story, I said. Star. I come across Bug while she's writing in the ship's log. A wild script, scritchy scratchy, like a crab had a seizure in her inkwell. She's wearing the radio headset and she listens intently. Is she transcribing, writing down orders? I look over her shoulder. True, it must get boat working, must reach surface, no air, fill in rage, wants sex. Bug, I whisper, surrounding her with warmth and light. She drops her pen and leaves from her seat. The radio headset clatters to the floor and I pick it up. I hear a familiar voice coming through. You found dead girl, I say. No, I didn't, says Bug. She found me. Dead girl takes a body and appears in the control room. She sits on the edge of the tiny linoleum counter and dangles her legs. She's wearing a black crinoline dress and a petticoat, lace-up boots, and stiff white stockings. Of course, she doesn't have a real body. She did have one a long time ago, and now she's attached to the outcome of the body. What I mean is, she's attached to Catherine. Dead girl hangs around Catherine. She's not a ghost. She's family. I'm glad you're here, I tell her. I want to run something by you. She says, go ahead with her eyes. I put on the headphones. Can't take a chance that True will hear us. I've been thinking. Don't do that, says Bug. Maybe we're dead. Dead girl comes into the headphones and her body dissolves, just disappears. The dress, the boots, poof. Go on. I want to say her voice is loud, but a loud voice is jarring and unpleasant. Dead, dead girl's voice is symphonic, excited, expansive. Loud is the wrong word. Maybe we die and get born again, I say. Yes, she sings back. You're exactly right. If we were dead, we'd know, says Bug. Don't stop. Keep going, Star. Every night, when Catherine goes to sleep, we die and are born again. But then, in bigger ways, we die every day and are born again. Then, in even bigger ways, because we learn to think about life differently, Catherine dies too. She dies while she's still alive, always already dead. If we stay awake, if we're willing and open, if we can be brave. You may be dead, says Bubba, but I'm not. Catchy. Catchy is the is another character who's sort of the younger, another younger version of Catherine. I stood on the dock, I wiped my hands on my shorts. I can do this in my own voice, which is a little bit real relief, I gotta tell you. <laughs> Okay, let me start <laughs> Catchy. I stood in the dock. I wiped my hands on my shorts. My fingers were sweaty. My face sticky. The air was humid. Bug music everywhere. I was home now, and so was my dad. He stood on the deck watching me. His entire body radiated anger. Rage was expected and usual. I stood there, too, paralyzed in my own submissive smolder. Nothing better to do. Really, what the hell did anyone have to do? It was the 4th of July, a holiday. A jet ski buzzed by on the lake close to the shore. My dad hated jet skis almost as much as he hated dogs, particularly Dobermans and German Shepherds. Maybe it was love, not hate. Maybe it was both for him. He also hated the neighbor's cat. He scratched up the top of his convertible and devoured her own babies. And he hated the neighbor. No love there. Or maybe he had sex with her sometimes. I don't know what went on in the 80s. <laughs> Dad told me often how much he hated his life situation, which was servitude to the dollar and choicelessness, something he may have chosen. Dad didn't see it that way. He hated the young guy on the jet ski more than he hated the actual jet ski, despite its horrible buzzing noise and the fumes and the spray, but he hated that too. I knew his grudges better than I knew my own. <laughs> the jet ski made wide circles in the center of the lake then looped down to the far end and lunged back again to the other side with a tail of white spray. I like things juicy, always have. Sometimes juicy means painful, juicy means alive, and things were starting to feel awful dry. I let Dad stare at me with hatred on his face. I was his, after all, his to hate. The last part I'll read is Catherine. 
The lawyer's office building sat right next to a sewage treatment plant. We met in the atrium, which felt like a mall, small mall. Glass everywhere, shiny green reflective windows, fountains, and cheap marble. The lawyer told me that one time, a drunk driver lost control of his car and drove right through the plate glass. He crashed into the lobby, and he wasn't hurt. Not a scratch. He got out and started to look at a road map. I said, he must have been pretty wasted. Drugs have guardian angels. Everyone has a guardian angel, even lawyers. The lawyer thought about this for a second. People die anyway, he said. And the angels cry harder than we do when that happens. Do you believe that? I try to. We went upstairs. In the elevator, he said, I see you wear a wallet chain. I looked down at the silver chain that buckled onto the belt loop of my jeans, then drooped down and attached to a black leather wallet I wore in my back pocket. Chain wallet, actually. So off-brand for suburban mom. I had only just started wearing it. I copied a guy, Jim, an ex-con, actually, a friend in recovery. Phil hated the wallet chain. So did my kids. The lawyer stepped off the elevator. I followed him into his office, which felt like the catalog version of the lawyer's office, like a set on the Wheel of Fortune, all put together already. But he appeared to be a good lawyer. He wore glasses. He had a receding hairline. According to his framed certificate, he went to a law school. What's on your mind? So I think at this point we can open it to audience question and answer. Does anybody have um, a question for who? If not, I can start. You know, a lot of the book seems to be about, you know, what is normal and what is not normal and kind of examining our perceptions of normality. And can you give us your take on that and where did that happen? Is that a, a theme that you see as running through the book? Um, yeah, I could definitely see that as a theme running through the book. And, and what I was thinking as you were talking is that normal is one of those words that is very limiting and that um, kind of applies to the surface of our reality, I think, and not what's going on inside all of us all the time. Um, and, and that is a, a, it's just a preoccupation of mine is the difference between what shows on the surface and what's going on underneath. And I think that, um, I don't know, I feel like with my kids, for example, like we'll be talking about anyone, I'll be like, oh, that person's crazy, or that person's crazy. And I'm like, then I'm like, everybody's crazy. Like everybody's crazy. Like you can't, if you start categorizing people as crazy and not crazy, you're in trouble. And so again, like I just like in terms of things that are unnameable or unspeakable, I just really want to just open up the aperture wider. Um, so in that sense, it is a, it is an exploration of that. And also when you were talking, I was thinking about what's going on right now in Israel. You know, like in some ways it's normal, but it's been going on my whole life. I was born on June 6, 1967, which I think was like the beginning of the Six Day War. And um, so my whole life there's been conflict there. So at some level it's normal, but there's just nothing normal about it. Um, and we normalize things that should never be normalized. And the, uh, another thing is, um, well, anyway, that's not, <laughs> not to get off on that tangent, but yeah, I just think it's really important. And I think that's a writer's job to take words or or limitations and blow them up. Okay, other questions? Yeah. You can talk about this book for a really long time without getting to the divorce. And the divorce <laughs> is really, feels really important to that character, right? Um, and it, people write whole books about divorce, but this, is, this does not come in that way. It does feel incredibly important that she's separating from him, but. I wonder what more you want to say about that. Well, I thought about that just now because I've read the scene where she goes to see a divorce lawyer and um, and then that's a little cliffhanger there. Um, I, well, that is, you know, again, in, in the editing, um, before I went to the, um, I mean, here's the thing about writing a novel and, and, and I am really proud of this novel because I really do think it's a page turner. It may not sound like the traditional page turner, but I do feel that, it's, that there's a churn to the book, and that was very hard to get. And it's very hard, very, very hard. This is my fourth novel I've written, first one I've gotten published. It's very hard when you're a person like me and you want to say big things about big concepts to make it like make the, the story alive all the way through to the end. And that is, and 
I, I'll, I'll put a novel down if that doesn't happen. I put a lot of novels down. It is not easy. So the divorce. So when I when I, I took the book to someone, I took it out. My agent there. I took it out on submission. It didn't get taken. Almost got taken twice by two people. It was so close. So I, I took it back and I was like, what can I do to make it better? And it had to do with Catherine, the main character's conflict. Like, what is the thing that she needs? You know, in a traditional fictional structure. What is the thing she needs in order to move on with her life, or what's her big conflict? And so it became this, this. Uh, I, I I really heightened the divorce and the marriage, and um, the problem in the marriage, and that's sort of her. I want to say that's her mundane problem because underneath her, there's all this nuts of stuff going on with these people on the submarine. But the thing is, it's all talking to each other. So if something if she's having sex with her husband. You better believe that those three kids down the submarine are watching and experiencing that and have a lot to say about it. And so that becomes the kind of conversation which I think keeps the book moving forward, which is what a book has to do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the sections lead into one another, or do I, as a reader, go to one section and then decide, almost like I would have had to have read the book and then go back and then decide what section I want to drive a storyline forward. And if I read it again, does it go into a different storyline? So the book is no, that, that sort of makes it sound like Calvino or like Borges or something. And I'm really not good at math, so like I would, it is not, it's not like a choose your own adventure kind of thing. It's it definitely has a a, a line that it follows. Um, so, but. It's more like they're, like I talk about like the oil. There's the oil drill. Like the oil drill is one of the big images, and it, so it kind of story kind of goes down and comes up the way an oil drill does, rather than just going forward. It goes down and up and down and up, but, but it's still there's a repetition to it. But every time it goes down, I find something different to bring up, and that's sort of revisiting things, but trying to find the truth. Um, so in that sense, um, you can only read it in one direction. But I have had people. Which is really flattering to me. I've had a lot of people say they immediately want to go back and read it again, and that they have read it more than once because the second time around you're going to see things you didn't see the first. And I, so I think, if anything, that's more characteristic. Okay. I don't know if I need a mic. We have okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to be reading this book. Um, as you were reading, my mind was pinging in lots of directions, and I, I really love Virginia. You're your bookshelf, and you described to us the, the conversation among selves that you're creating. Uh, you know, I was thinking UNESCO, and then I was thinking Beloved, and then, I, you know, um, and I just wonder what what the conver what, what your bookshelf was for this book. Like, who were you in conversation with and in terms of other writers, if they were writers or? Um, I would say more, um, rather than pinpointing Writers, I, in my very first book event, I compared myself to Dostoevsky. You know, I learned from that. I was like, "What are you saying?" As, as like, my first time talking about my book in front of other people, like going deeper and deeper into this very arrogant sounding. Um, so I will, I will not compare it to other writers tonight. But um, if I were going to see it on a shelf, I would love to see it like in between self help and literary fiction. You know, I really, I or psychology. You know, I, I really feel. I read tons of that. I just read tons of um, philosophy, psychology, and and I mean self help is a reductive description, but books written from people's experience that are meant to help other people cope, live, survive, thrive. Like I love it. And books are teachers. And I mean, so many of my gurus are teachers, are books. And so that's what I want this book to be. But then also, it, I am also a literary fiction writer, and I love. Be challenged by what I read, and so in that sense, on the self-help books, sometimes just have the first chapter has a point to make, and then it's just repetition. So uh, I, I I believe in like the sort of integrity and beauty of a work of written fiction. So I would like to see it somewhere there. And also, I want to thank you who, and Labyrinth and Virginia and every and Christy so much and Princeton University Press and the Princeton Public Library and the Humanities Council. I know it all because I've been doing all the social media. Otherwise, I might have forgotten <laughs> something. Um, but yeah, and that's how I learned how to say my brother's wife's brother's wife. Um, but thank all of you, and thank all of you for coming because it's just really meaningful to be able to talk about in front of people that care. So thank you. Thank you.
and even better is that this is going to live on on the library's YouTube channel. Excellent. So you can share that link out. So I'm going to just Great. wrap us up for the evening. We've kind of come to the end of our time. So Labyrinth does have books for sale out in our lobby just outside the newsroom here. And you'll be doing some signing. And um, I want to wish you well on the tour. And I look forward to your next book. And um, you'll have to let us know when it comes out and maybe come back down to Princeton again. I'd love to. It's okay. only an hour. And it's a beautiful drive, actually. It is a, it is a a lovely drive from North Jersey down. Depending on how you go, but I drove down by a river, but I've never gone that way. It was a beautiful river the whole way. So, okay, let's give a little round of applause. Yeah.